Hey hey everybody, it's Overkill here with another Total War Warhammer Faction talk through focus thing. So today we'll be talking about the fifth and final faction for Total War Warhammer, the Greenskins. Now, the Greenskins are one of the, or have rather one of the largest selections of units in the game so far. They have possibly the largest roster revealed so far out of the five factions. Of course, we haven't received the ro the full roster for the vampire counts, but even then I believe the roster for the orcs is the largest of the five, and will be the largest of the five. The orcs are a horde army in the lore in Warhammer. Now I have some grim things to think about because of the recent battle shown against the Bretonians by the Greenskins where the units aren't that big and they are comparable in size to the human units, so I'm not sure if CA are going for balance reasons as to not have the orc units bigger, but it is a bit of a shame. But it's something that I can live with, of course. It's just that on the tabletop, they of course have more numbers due to goblins and other races of, apart from orcs. The orcs themselves actually usually have a few smaller units than maybe some other factions So because the orcs are bigger. So it's something that I'm not quite upset about. But the fact that they're a horde army in the lore is kind of taken away by one, unit sizes being the same as some of the other factions. And two, 20 unit cap on armies. But either way, not a big deal. They have the largest mix of different creatures comparable to the vampire counts, and you'll see as we look at the roster. They have very few elite units though, the only elite unit really being the black orcs, because they are a very, they are a race of orc that have been experimented on essentially by the chaos dwarves. They've been created apart from normal dwarves. They don't fight against each other in the way that normal orcs do, they still fight if they're apart from different tribes and such. They're very disciplined, they follow the they follow orders very well, as such as that. They have very few units of artillery, only having the Doom Diver Catapult and the Rock Lava, which are confirmed for the roster. I'm not sure if they'll have their spear chukkas and stuff like that, but of course we'll see as the game as the game progresses. And they also have very powerful shamans. They are very big on magic and using their gods to help them in their magic, but we'll get to that later. Now, a couple of features that we've actually had confirmed to us by Creative Assembly that involve the orcs are the encamped recruitment anywhere in the world. They can set up a camp stance and they can recruit units as if they were just pulling orcs from the land, which essentially they are, which is very interesting. And they also have the WOG mechanic. Now, the WOG mechanic is if you're doing very well with your legendary lord, I believe. I don't know if other war bosses can do this, uh, your other lords, essentially. But um, if you're doing very well, having lots of victories and lots of big battles with your legendary lords, a twin army, not a twin army, uh, a, a sister army, I don't know, will appear and follow you around, and you can give it orders to attack certain things. It's a full stack of orcs and goblins that you can order around apart from your other army. So that's a very cool mechanic on behalf of CA, and I'm very excited to see how it works further when the game is actually released. So that's been the characteristics and some mechanics of the Greenskins. Now we move into geography. Now, the majority of the orcs live in the desolate lands of the Badlands, although many Greenskin tribes have made their refuge in the forests of the Old World and the mountains, some even living in the bad uh, the Badlands, the Darklands, the Chaos Wastes, everywhere. The orcs are everywhere. They are one of the races that live in pretty much all of... The entire Warhammer world, essentially. But in Warhammer, you're going to be starting in the Badlands, so that's what we're going to be focusing on. Now, the Badlands are a desolate region of barren rock, arid plains, and searing desert that stretches between the towering World's Edge Mountains and the shores of the Black Gulf. Of course, we'll have this all on a map for you guys to see right now. It has the largest concentration of greenskins in the world, and to venture into the Badlands is to gamble your life, as safe travel is impossible even with a massive accompanying army due to the harsh landscape and its less than friendly inhabitants. There are other things that live there other than orcs. Uh, for example, in the south there are ogres, that are nomads of course, so they can live off the land like that. There are chaos beasts, uh, there are packs of chaos hounds and such. Basically things that aren't human though. And there's been a lot of controversy over Total War Warhammer as people using the Badlands as a reason that humans can't conquer them. And I agree. It is impossible to live there as a human. And I don't care if you say, like, oh, you can spend time irrigating the land, making it livable. It's not. And CA aren't, just aren't going to bother with going into detail about that. Although they have said that in the other games, this f system of not being able to conquer the whole map won't exist. So I'm not going to get into it. I'm not saying you're wrong for not wanting it. I'm upset that you can't conquer the whole map. But at the same time, I don't really care because I never really have conquered the entire map. That's my personal opinion. You guys are all right. 
everybody's right. Their opinions are all right. You can love them or hate them for taking off the, or taking out the conquering the whole map. Both both sides are correct. But in my opinion, the Badlands shouldn't be inhabitable by people other than orcs. But yet at the same time, this adds on to the conversation. I'm not bashing CA. I'm not supporting either side. But the dwarfs can conquer the Badlands. So, yeah, I don't know. Either way, let's move on. That's not what this video is about. Before being completely controlled by the Greenskins, however, humans did live in the Badlands before it became the Badlands, essentially. And this this race of people was known as the Strigos Empire, but they were all de but destroyed by a huge Wa that attacked the city Morcane, and the Empire was shortly destroyed in its entirety, and ever since the Badlands have been near inhospitable by essentially every race apart from the Greenskins and Ogres, as I mentioned in the south. Human armies, dwarf expeditions, or even undead hordes of the Strigoi bloodline have tried time and time again to reclaim some of the lands from the Greenskins, but they're always just thrown back. There's just so many orcs, and it is a very big reason for the orcs to actually band together to fight against them. Now, the orcs are separated into a bunch of tribes, we'll get to that in a second, and usually fight each other, but as soon as they see someone that isn't a, an orc essentially trying to get into their turf, they'll join together to stop them. But until the time comes when a warlord of great strength or and cunning can unite them, the Badlands will only be a region of constant and bloody warfare, with bones of the dead littering the landscape for miles upon miles around. So on that cheery note talking about the Badlands, let's talk about the government and rulership of the orcs, or lack thereof. There is no set government for the orcs, their race is split into countless tribes across the entire world, all of which are led by what is known as a boss. Now a boss is the largest and most powerful orc in the tribe, and usually he acquires the title of boss by killing as many orcs as he can that think that they're better than him. And all these tribes are relatively hostile towards each other, of course, though some are friendly and kind of allied together in a very loose term. It all depends, basically. As soon as a war boss dies, or a boss rather dies, that grouping, that friendship is just gone. Only when a terrible, large, and powerful and or cunning boss comes along will he become a war boss. Now, a war boss is someone who can unite more than one tribe, essentially. He becomes very powerful, and this usually involves a lot of killing of other bosses and lower orcs. And eventually, when a war boss acquires enough of a following, and more and more tribes flock to his banner, he can form a WOG, which is essentially an orc crusade to pillage and destroy any target that they so desire, really. The two confirmed legendary lords for the orcs are the leaders of Great Waz, just as an example. Grimgor and Azhag. A wog continues until either the war boss is killed fighting or another orc usurps him. At that point, either the wog will diminish or turn on a new target. So after talking about that, that's a very brief uh, understanding of orc culture and society, essentially. We'll talk about religion. Now, the Greenskins worship two gods, Gork, who's brutally cunning, and Mork, who's cunningly brutal. What may appear as a riddle is actually as simple as any pagan religion. Gork is the god of clobbering, smashing, breaking, killing, and pummeling the rest of the world into submission, and appeals more to the orcs, where Mork is the god of cunning and magic, where Gork would smash an enemy in the face, Mork would wait until he's turned around and then bash him in the back of the head. This appeals more to the goblin side of the greenskin race. All greenskins worship these gods as they have been manifested by the race's primal instincts and emotions. And that literally means that the instincts and emotions have actually created gods in the realm of chaos. The orcs have created their own chaos gods, essentially. Now, I'm not saying they're chaos gods. Don't even start on that conversation. Don't even start on the whole controversy. Oh my god, you're an idiot. How are you saying they're chaos gods? I'm literally saying that there's so many orcs and goblins that their, their, their mindset have manifested gods in the realm of chaos. If you don't believe me, look up on Warhammer Wiki or Lexiconum or whatever it's from. Yeah, it's that is it. They are, they are gods created in the realm of chaos. That's why they're just as powerful as the chaos gods. How shamans can cast in the fo the foot of Gork or the foot of Mork or is it Gork? I don't know. That's how the orcs think. But they ca they cast the foot of Gork, I believe, and it just flattens things. It a, a real foot comes down and crushes things, and we've seen this in the Battle of Blackfire Pass. So yeah, they're pretty powerful in the uh, in the pantheon of gods that occupy the Warhammer world. So now we'll move on to the military. So we are going to take a look at the confirmed roster and a couple, actually I think maybe just a unit that was added onto it, I'm not quite sure. But the roster will be on here for a second. You can take a look at it real quick. Probably going to have to be two pictures. But and as you can see, it is huge. It is po the biggest roster we've seen so far, and it, I believe it will be bigger 
than the Vampire Counts roster. But anyway, let's take a look. So for our Lords, we have Orc War Bosses, which are melee, and you can see a picture of them. Of course, I'll have pictures everywhere. And these are just, as I said, the War Bosses. They are leaders of great tribes, and they can start Waz, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, they'll they'll just be the head of the of the of the army. They'll charge headlong into a fight, and they'll kill many, 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 many things before either dying themselves or winning and destroying the enemy force. We then have goblin great, excuse me, goblin great shamans, and these are casters of the little wa, which is the goblin magic. And again, goblins appeal are like Mork a lot, so a lot of their spells are going to come from Mork, of course. Now, I don't I don't I'm not quite I don't quite remember if in the Battle of Blackfire Pass there was an orc shaman or a goblin shaman that ca that cast the foot of Gork. I think it was a goblin. So I'm interested to see what the spells will be from both because I was pretty sure that the foot of Gork was a big wa spell, but they cast it with a goblin, I believe. So I'm interested to see what will happen. But either way, we then have the heroes, and these are going to be the agents. The goblin big boss, which is a melee guy. We have the night goblin shaman, which is another caster, and an orc shaman, which is another caster. So it's going to be interesting to see the abilities that all of these people have. And the fact that the orcs and goblins have the largest selection of magic so far because they have three casting units in just the lords and heroes. So that's going to be very interesting. But yeah, the goblin big boss picture is a melee lord or a melee hero, of course. He'll probably be someone that makes armies better or makes goblin units better. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what to speak of in terms of their abilities. I can't speak on that because I don't know, so I'm not going to mention anything just to get any ideas in people's heads, but you can imagine that what they might be able to do. We then have the Night Goblin Shaman, and Night Goblins are really cool, and I'm very excited to see Night Goblins in the game because they're my favorite unit of goblins in Warhammer, and they're just hopped up on all kinds of drugs, uh, mushroom drugs and stuff, and they're going to be really cool to see because they're absolutely crazy. Then we have the Orc Shaman, which is just a, another caster. He'll have more powerful spells, I would imagine, and he would appeal more to maybe Orc units. Um... But again, I'm not quite sure. So we move on to mounts. We have Skullmuncha, which is a unique wyvern, and only Azhag can ride him. And Skullmuncha is a crazy big wyvern. Um, he's very powerful, and it's going to be interesting to see Azhag flying around, killing a bunch of stuff on the field of battle in Warhammer. It's going to be awesome. We then have giant wolves. Pretty self-explanatory. It's a big wolf. It, really fast. Uh, quite powerful. Only, uh, giant wolves can only be ridden by goblins. I don't. I'm not, they haven't said that in the roster. But, yeah, you won't see orcs on wolves. And, in fact, the next one, giant spiders. Again, quite self-explanatory. You won't see orcs on those either. Orcs ride war boars and war boar chariots and wyverns, of course. So, they should have maybe specified a bit more in the roster what orcs and goblins can ride. But these are not, uh, these are not able or available for all orcs and goblins. So, just if you got any ideas. So, then we have the war boar, which is the first mount for orcs. These are big boars that are usually armored, sometimes they're not though, and they're just f just full of muscle. Like if you can imagine a wild hog and makes it make it like six times bigger, that's a war boar. And that's just going to bowl through units. We've seen in the battle against Bretonia how they just flew through the enemy archer units. It was quite entertaining. We then have wolf and war boar chariots. Now wolf chariots are for goblins, and chariots are going to be very entertaining to see. It's going to be cool to see them just plowing through enemy units. These big ramshackle wooden chariots drawn by either wolves or war boars. They're going, to, they're going to be very entertaining to watch. And seeing them on the battlefield is going to be very cool. Just that, just the orcs in general. I'm so excited. They are one of my favorite factions, although I do own the models for all five of the confirmed factions for the first game. Um, the greenskins are probably one of my favorites just because of how unique they are and the fact that orcs are the best, obviously. But, yeah. Then the war boar chariot. It's just the same thing as a wolf chariot. It's bigger. Orcs ride it instead of goblins, and it's drawn by war boars. Then we have the wyvern, which is just the non-unique wyvern. It's a, a wyvern from any other fantasy, and even, well, not real history, but, you know, the real, like, tales of real wyverns and stuff and all that. Um, it's just a big dragon. Not a big dragon. A small dragon. You know what I mean. Nah. Anyway, let's move on. So next we have the melee infantry, and as you can see, there's a lot of them. First we have goblins. Now these are the lowest of the low, basically, for for uh, orcs and goblins. These are just the basic step mountain goblins. They're what is there to say about them? They they're just they're just little tiny guys, about half the size, or maybe 
I'm not quite sure. In terms of models, they're smaller, but in the game, they might be the same size as a human because orcs are bigger than people. I'm not quite sure what they're going to do, but either way, goblins are a very cowardly race that at any sign of losing a battle or even a front-on engagement, they don't really like to stand there and they'll possibly run away. And this is where the idea of Mork and Gork come into play. Gork is just head-on charging, and that's what the orcs do. Mork is more about being sneaky and going around. That's what the goblins do. The goblins are going to be at home as a flanking force. Do not, and I just don't, just don't even try to have goblins on the front lines because they will be destroyed and they will run away. They are a flanking force, and that is essentially what they're for. Gotcha. Then we then move on to the night goblins. Now, the night goblins are an ex exception to the goblins because they are drugged. They are crazy. They will have more morale than a, than a normal goblin. Although, again, they're still going to be really squishy. Any basic unit from the other factions can kill them. They'll be really good for flanking, as they won't be as cowardly as goblins. And I'm not quite sure if they're going to implement it into Warhammer, but night goblins can also accompany or be accompanied by berserker or uh, fanatics, rather. And these are really hopped up guys. They're just on so many drugs that they don't even know what to do themselves. And they carry around a big ball and chain that's obviously in, like, impossible to carry around by a normal goblin, but they're so intoxicated that they can just swing it around and they get released. So it's going to be a random factor thing. So much like magic, it could come back into the unit and kill all of them. Who knows? I'm not quite sure how they'll implement it. I hope they do. It would be quite awesome to see. So then we have orc boys, and these are the bread and butter of any orc army. Orc boys are the essential unit of any orc army. They are the basic orcs, through and through. You can see them there. Uh, spears, shields, swords, or choppas, rather. They're not, they're not called anything like that. And a chop, a choppa can be anything from an axe to a sword, anything. And these are just big, brutish, bulking, humanoid creatures that are just all obsessed with fighting and killing stuff. And it's going to be interesting to see for for orcs what how upkeep is going to work, because orcs don't get paid essentially um they don't they're not like hey war boss give me money for fighting they're like hey war boss let's fight so i don't kill myself or kill someone else so it's going to be interesting to see and then a step up from that we have the savage orcs now the savage orcs come from a different part of the badlands completely they come from they can also come from jungle type environments these are more primal orcs they don't wear armor they don't have steel or, or iron weapons or whatever material they use rock bone wood and they cover themselves in tattoos which are actually magical and they can actually protect them they make their they make their a bit, them a bit more tough and yeah it's going to be very interesting to see these guys they're going to be more of a shock infantry i would imagine because they're crazy they're they don't even think like normal orcs which is already pretty bad they're very simple and i th i would believe that savage orcs would be very hard to route but i'm not sure again i don't know what they're going to do in total war warhammer it's going to be out there so let me move on to biggins. Now biggins and savage orc biggins, of course I'll have pictures of both. Uh, actually, there aren't really pictures of either for models, but imagine, I'm just going to keep the pictures of the savage and whatever. Imagine bigger orcs, not twice the size, but maybe like, no, not even that big. They're bigger, alright? They're more muscular, they're bigger. These are just upgraded units, essentially. Biggins are the toughest. Like imagine an orc unit, or imagine a unit from Total War led by a champion. Now, think of orcs, and then a champion of an orc unit, that would probably be a biggin. And imagine a unit full of biggins, and there you go, you have the biggins. They're just more powerful orcs, they're bigger, they're more aggressive, they're crazier, they have, they're gonna have better stats, obviously. It's essentially that. And then finally, for melee infantry, we have black orcs. Now, black orcs are a sub-race of orcs that were created, essentially, by the Chaos Dwarfs. And what's unique about black orcs is they don't fight amongst themselves like normal orcs do. They're disciplined, they can follow orders from war bosses, and they are absolutely crazy at killing. They are the elite unit of the orcs, pretty much the only elite unit essentially. And it's going to be interesting to see them because in the tabletop they can choose to fight with any weapon. They can choose to fight with a weapon and shield, two weapons. Or great weapons so it's gonna be interesting to see if they're gonna be multiple units or if they're gonna do something fancy with total warhammer I'm not sure but as you can see they are absolutely crazy and the legendary Lord Grimgore Ironhide is a black work so if that just adds to him being a badass so then for missile infantry we have goblin archers now it's just the same thing as goblins they're cowardly this is the ideal <laughs> position for goblins if you can have an army a melee component of orcs and then a ranged component of goblins that would be pretty good 
goblins like to stay in the back where they won't get attacked basically and they can just shoot for days all their bows and stuff and yeah what can i say they're they're better archers than orcs i'm not quite sure if they'll reflect that in total war but in the warhammer tabletop they are better archers so i guess that's what would be ideal for them we then have night goblin archers which is again again the same thing these guys would be a little bit less frightened by everything like the goblins are um again better archers than orcs so there you go we then have orc error uh orc and savage orc error boys now these are again just take an orc or savage orc unit give them bows that's the unit. They're not going to be any less good at fighting. They're orcs. An orc isn't like, oh, I can't fight because I'm an archer, just like somebody else would. They'd, they'd have a choppa. They'd have a full-size choppa. So it, nothing's going to stop them. But you can see they're just orcs with bows. Nothing too fancy. So then we move on to the next section, which is melee monstrous infantry. And we have trolls. Now, trolls are very simplified in this list, of course. In the tabletop, there are stone, river, and trolls yeah there's stone river and just normal trolls and i'll have pictures of all three now i'm not sure if they'll implement all of these into total war but they all have their own fancy things stone trolls are tough whereas trolls are like the cheaper more just normal trolls and river trolls are these big fat bloated fishy i don't even know how to describe it but they i don't know i don't know how to really describe it. but basically all the trolls will have um, basically the same abilities where they can all vomit on people and stomp them with their clubs and stuff. They're all big. They can smash people out of the way. We've seen them in the Ambush at the Thundering Falls and the Battle of Fac uh, Blackfire Pass. So it will be interesting. They've only shown one unit of trolls. They haven't shown the other two. So I assume that trolls will be the only one, which is fine by me, of course. N there's no need to bring in so much diversity in the fact of having three different types of trolls, but you know it would be nice to see all of them. Then for melee monsters, we have the Arachnorok Spider, and this is an absolutely huge beast. And we've seen this in the Battle of Blackfire Pass of Gant, or Battle of Blackfire Pass, rather, again, and the Ambush of the Thundering Falls. It's a huge hulking spider. It's probably the biggest unit so far in the game, and it's an absolute beast to take down. Um, everybody seems to have trouble with it at the Ambush of the Thundering Falls, um, trying to take it down with their legendary lords and their artillery, and it just won't go down. So it's going to be very cool to see in the actual game. And these are crewed by forest goblins. Now, forest goblins haven't been represented anywhere else other than this. So it's going to be quite interesting to see them. We then have giants. Now, giants are actually not unique to, to the orcs. Uh, many factions can actually recruit giants in the tabletop. Chaos can have giants. Beastmen can have giants. Orcs ogres and a few other factions can all have giants but they're the only ones they're actually no the chaos have giants on their list as well i'm pretty sure now that i think back on it i'm not quite sure i think they did though but either way that just adds on to the point that yeah they a bunch of people have giants but as we've mentioned before giants are huge humanoid creatures that just crush people with their feet and swing around with their clubs and stuff and pick people up and eat them and when they fall over they crush a bunch of people and kill them it's going to be pretty cool to see so then we have a few more just huge sections. We have melee cavalry, where we have forest goblin spider riders, and as I said earlier, the arachnorok spider and the forest goblin spider riders are the only part where forest goblins are actually mentioned in the roster. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, all these spiders crawling around and biting people and poisoning people, and of course... Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. We've seen, I believe the Spider Riders were in the Ambush of the Thundering Falls. They were the flanking cavalry in that. Yes, they were. And you, they're absolute, They're just ridiculously fast. And they're going to be probably tougher than wolves, I would imagine. But I'm not quite sure. And I believe that Forest Goblin, or the Spider Riders, will also be... Yes, it says... Okay, we'll get to that in a second. There's also ranged units of these. So, actually, we might as well talk about that now. The melee cavalry and missile cavalry we'll just put together. So, the Forest Goblin Spider Riders have melee and ranged units that are that have bows. So, think of horse archers, only there's going to be Forest Goblin Spider Riders with bows and melee. Then there's also the Goblin Wolf Riders, who you can see on the screen now. And they have the same story. There's melee and archers. So they're going to be interesting. Very fast cavalry with goblins. And of course goblins being better archers than orcs. They'll actually be sensibly accurate. So uh, yeah. Horse archers making their way into Total War Warhammer boys. It's confirmed. Have fun with that. But uh, yeah. Goblin wolf riders. They're not really. They're good for a flanking force. They'll be really good for taking down enemy ranged units. 
because, well, they're wolves and spiders. Okay, talking about the, we won't talk about the forest goblins anymore. Um, but the, these wolves will just, you know, they'll, they're dangerous. It's not like the old Total War games where a horse will just kick someone randomly sometimes. These mounts are out to kill people. Like, the boars, the wolves, the horses of the empire, the chaos beasts, they're all out to kill people. So you, not only are you going to see the riders killing stuff, but the actual mounts themselves are going to be wrecking people at the same time. So cavalry are going to be a very important factor in Warhammer as they all hurt stuff. Like, all the... All the mounts hurt people. So then we have orc boar boys. Now these are going to be shock cavalry through and through. Like, sure the orcs are good for fighting, but these boars are just going to bowl through anything you charge them at. And it goes down the list. We have savage orc boar boys and biggins for both types. So I'll have pictures of all of them, except for the biggins, of course, because there aren't pictures of biggin units. Um, but yeah, it's it's the savage orcs again. The same story. They're not armored. They have just war paint so these are going to be maybe the the boar boys the normal orcs are going to be more of a melee unit and savage orcs are going to be a more of a shock unit because they're just crazy they're going in there with two hand weapons not even holding on to the boar just sh chopping 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 killing everybody it's going to be very interesting to see what total war actually um uh, or well creative assembly actually label them as but you can imagine that a big boar charging into a line of humans they're going to go flying and it's going to be very 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 satisfying so we covered the missile cavalry by talking about the forest goblins and the goblin wolf riders. So now we move on to vehicles where we have the goblin and orc chariots, or the wolf and boar chariots rather, which again, we already kind of talked about in the mounts for lords, but of course we'll just go through them again, uh, where the wolf chariots just running around. The wolves are very quick. So these guys have like little sides on the wheels. They can go around chopping people's legs off and stuff and all that. There's going to be archers shooting from the back and all that, the goblin archers. And with the boar chariots, there's going to be orcs on the back just chopping and stabbing people with spears and stuff. Again, the, I think their scythes on the wheels of orc boar chariots, so they're going to be rolling through, killing everybody. And the boars, of course, are just going to be bowling everybody out of the way. You're not going to be able to really stop a boar chariot unless you just make them charge into like a wall of pikes or halberds or something. It's going to be very interesting to see. And then for art artillery, the final section, we have the Doom Diver Catapult, which is probably the most hilarious unit in Warhammer, let's be honest, where they load a goblin into the thing with little canvas wings and a little uh, iron cap that looks like a, that makes him look like a missile. They launch him out with the slingshot, and he flies to the target. And we've seen this in the Battle of Blackfire Pass, and it's absolutely hilarious. These are going to be so fun to control, and they've already confirmed that you can control them in this game. So can you imagine controlling a goblin in third-person view as it dives in to a unit and just like sends people flying everywhere it's going to be so entertaining and i can't wait to see it happen and then in i kind of accidentally ca have confirmed actually they might have did they do a video about it i'm not quite sure but before they possibly did a video or released a picture or something there was a picture of a building that had a rock lava next to it as a an upgrade that you unlocked so the rock lava i'm just going to have it as a confirmed unit basically this is just a catapult think of a catapult from other games it's a i believe a counterweight catapult or kind of a, like a trebuchet thing if i if the model is coming correctly into my into my memory but yeah it's just a rock lobber it's just gonna throw rocks at the enemy akin to trebuchets and catapults of the other factions so after speaking of the roster for a very long time, that pretty much took up all the time of this video. Basically, everything else was quite quick. Uh, we now move on to the legendaries, which there are two so far, which I believe there will be more. Actually, I think CA have already confirmed that there is a third, and that would be um, Wurzeg, the Great Green Prophet. So I wrote a, um, I, I wrote up information for Ozheg and Grimgore as they are the two confirmed, like already in the game, ready to go legendary lords. But since uh, Warzag is very important, I will just touch on him in a second for a little bit, where he is, as his name suggests, the prophet of the orc gods Gork and Mork, and he is tasked with pretty much uniting all of the orcs into creating the biggest wa that the world has ever known, and yeah, that happens. And as we talk about Grimgor later, you'll see that. But he is very important. He will be a next, the, uh, the third legendary lord for the orcs, as confirmed by CA, I believe. So, yeah, he's pretty awesome. Go Be sure to check out the lore on him, as we'll be talking about Azag and Grimgor in this episode. So, of course, the two legendaries are Azag and Grimgor that we know of right now, other than Morzag, like I just said. Azag is one of the most successful orc war bosses in history. Early in his reign, he acquired the Crown of Sorcery. Now, we've seen the Crown of Sorcery in the battle against Bretonia. It's what allows him to cast magical spells from the lore of 
not death. Maybe it is death. Either way, the lore shadows, I'm not quite sure. But the crown of sorcery is an ancient artifact which is occupied by a part of the soul of Nagash, which is the creator of the vampires and the Tomb King faction. So, yeah, he's a pretty nice dude. Um, the crown would whisper to Azag of great conquest in the south, and the crown gave Azag terrifying levels of tactics at, for an orc, of course, and even the ability of casting magic, enabling him to subjugate all of the tribes surrounding his. After many victories against larger tribes, uh, they started the the surviving ones started flocking towards Azag, and he began the invasion of the imperial province of Ostermark, beginning Wag Azag. Azag acquired his nickname of the Slaughterer after bat after the Battle of rather of Butcher's Hill, where he massacred an entire imperial army. Azag separated his army into three parts. His biggins and black orcs attacked the center of the imperial army, while goblins and orcs cut off any reinforcements. And then goblins and snotlings flanked the main army. Not a single human survived. No, snotlings weren't mentioned in the roster, but they're basically just a, a, a third green-skinned race. They're just really tiny. They're, like, even tinier than goblins. Azheg was slain, however, in the Battle of Osterwald after, due to being drained from his conflicts with the crown controlling his mind. In an argument with the crown, Azheg just so happened to also be in a duel with Werner von Kriedstalt who happened to be the Grand Master of the Knight's Panther, one of the many knightly orders of the Empire. Azhag's crown was recovered and locked away in the vaults of the Cathedral of Sigmar in Altdorf. So, yeah, at the, at the beginning, at the time of Total War Warhammer, Azhag should be dead, I believe, if Grimgor is ready to take over uh, or start his own WOG. So, it brings up the important question if CA is going to implement already dead characters as legendary lords. This would bring in people such as such as Vlad von Karstein and Conrad von Karstein for the vampire counts. It would introduce the orc warboss Gorbad Ironclaw, who's been dead for hundreds of years at the beginning of Total War. And it's just many more characters for the other races. So, it's going to be interesting if this means something good for dead characters in the Warhammer lore, as Azhag is dead, as I mentioned. But we move on to Grimgor. Grimgor is the greatest Black Orc war boss to ever live. He's never been defeated in a duel, and he's always he always looks for the thickest fighting and the toughest opponent to test his skills on. He has created a massive host of greenskins that has ravaged the Empire, Kingdom of Kislev, and the holds of the dwarfs for years. Now, Grimgor has way too much backstory to cover in this video as he becomes the the main character for the orcs in the end times, which, if you want to read on, go check it out on Lexiconum or Warhammer Wiki, stuff like that. Be sure to check that out because he's the main character of the, of, for the orcs, like I said, for the end times, and he has way too much backstory to cover. He could have a video for himself for all the stuff he's done. So I'll keep it short. He started out fighting the dwarfs. After winning a battle after battle with them, he got bored. That's literally the wording from, like, the lore. So he moved on to the Skaven in the other mountain holds and got bored of them after fighting uh, rat ogres, which he believed were the strongest thing that the Skaven could throw at him. So he decided to go northeast. His army had to cross the meeting of the World's Edge Mountains and the Mountains of Morn, which no one had done before. The trek had cost him nearly all of his goblins, which actually a lot were killed by him himself, but he didn't really care. And after a week, they made it to the open steps of the Darklands, which were on the other side, something that no nation had ever done before. But it was here that Grimgor would suffer his first defeat at the hands of Krom the Conqueror, a herald for Archaeon the Everchosen. Then the events of the End Times occurred right after, but we won't go into those again as I said, go read them, because they don't have anything to really do with Total War Warhammer, but they're very interesting. And But to, to pique your interest, Grimgor, now this is where Wurzag comes into, Wurzag puts together Grimgor and the goblin warboss Skarsnik into a great wa, and Grimgor manages to lead this wa to actually defeat all of the ogres, or the ogre kingdoms. He kills the great king of the ogres, and actually absorbs the ogre kingdoms into his wog, which creates the beast wog, where uh, he leads the ogres and orcs into the darklands and take and destroys the chaos dwarf empire. And, ah, so much stuff, but... Be sure to read up on that, guys, if it's in if it's interesting to you. I know a lot of people aren't interested in orcs. They're interested in the other factions. So this is for the people that are actually interested in the history of the orcs. Be sure to check that out. But anyway, guys, this is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed. And that brings an end to the five factions of Total War Warhammer. Now, if you guys would like to see more videos on factions that haven't been announced yet, such as High Elves, Dark Elves, Skaven, 
Bretonia, Lizardmen, all those other factions, be sure to leave a like and a comment down below and be sure to tell me what faction you would like to see next as I will get work to work on them as soon as possible. But anyway guys, this has been Overkill as always and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.